I think there are, there are two different questions. Uh, there are uh, what are the wishes on both sides, and then there is how will it happen. Now, the wish on both sides, uh, you're right, uh, there is an option. The UK uh, authorities can either rush or take time, and the desire on the EU side might be either to rush or to take a bit of time. I personally would advise uh, to take a bit of time, uh, the reality being that in many ways this is an unexpected outcome and that people uh, need a bit of time to seriously think about the consequences. So let's assume uh, what I think is wisdom will prevail, uh, which is that they both will take a bit of time. On the UK side, not least because you need a new prime minister, you need a new government, uh, you need parliament to make up its mind. Then the question is, uh, how long will it take uh, to negotiate uh, this uh, divorce agreement. My intuition, for what it's worth, is that it might take much longer than uh, both sides uh, either wish or expect. Right, because you have a lot of experience in negotiating trade deals. Um, some people suggest, and I, it's hard to know whether this is their fantasy because they didn't like the result or whether it's realistic, that there may be some kind of chance for a second referendum with some revised offer from the European Union. Do you think it is plausible for the British to come back, have a second referendum and stay in the European Union? Is that something you could imagine? It's something I could imagine, uh, but not under any condition. I think I could think of something like that, provided, provided it doesn't give to existing EU members the notion uh, that uh, you can uh, have it uh, both ways, uh, with uh, one foot in and one foot out. This is the limit of what existing EU27 governments uh, will uh, accept, uh, in my view. Now, if you take the example of trade, what we know is uh, the EU trade regime. It's well known. You have an external uh, tariff. Uh, you have conditions under which uh, you can sell uh, on the EU market. This is a totally known quantity. And by the way, it's the uh, binding uh, which the EU did uh, with the World Trade Organization. So this is known. What is unknown and will need to be known is what is the new UK trade policy. How much protection does uh, the UK uh, government want for its economy in goods and services? Uh, in other words, what will be the new WTO, most favoured nation, general, UK uh, trade regime, and on this nobody knows. What we've heard during the campaign, and I'm not saying that to be unnice uh, to uh, Brexit people, but we've he what we've heard during the campaign is all over the place. We've heard people saying, oh, this will be a good occasion to protect our cherished industries uh, from foreign dumping, like you know, anti-immigration. Others, like uh, Patrick Minford, have said, oh, at last, this is the occasion to apply what we should do, which is unilateral, zero-tariff trade regime. Now, in between, <laughs> there is a lot of possibilities, and this will need to be decided by uh, the British uh, Parliament. Now, once this is known, then you have to go to the next step, which is what sort of trade regime does the UK, new, and the EU existing, want to have together? Is it a super special relationship? Is it a special relationship? Is it a semi-special relationship? Is it an ordinary relationship? And then you've got all sorts of options on the table, Turkey, Norway, Switzerland, Canada, China. That will have to be uh, negotiated uh, as a function of what UK out 
authorities wish and what remaining EU27 wish. I'm sure that's not going to be simple nor easy and it will take a lot of time. And on top of that, assuming this can be solved, <laughs> and I've already you know, been speaking during a few minutes which shows that it is complex, then UK will also have to, re to renegotiate the 30 or 40 bilateral free trade agreements which EU has with other countries, which UK will lose as it exits EU right. and will have to renegotiate with these countries. We're into very complicated terrain. But just to strip away the complexity, there are some who are saying what the British would like or might want to adopt is some kind of associate membership that would preserve most of the single market or most access to the single market and passporting, for example, of our financial services firms so they can operate throughout the single market um, without special regulation or license. Now, do you think an associate membership of any kind will be on the table? It's, it's, it's perfect. It's, it's, it, for sure, it's an option. Right. And there are models of that on the market. The Swiss model, the Norwegian model, uh, uh, both have in common uh, something which Brexit people uh, say they would not do, uh, which is a free circulation of people. Switzerland and Norway are with, within yep. Schengen, which Great Britain was not. And second, they pay. There is, for the price of this special relationship, there is a contribution uh, to the uh, EU budget. So it's thinkable, it exists, and this probably can be negotiated. Uh, let's recognize that it's a fairly asymmetric negotiation. On the one side, UK would like to uh, keep access to uh, 40, uh, 150 million consumers. On the other side, assuming UK economy is somehow protected, uh, Europeans will want uh, to get access to a 60, 65 million uh, market. So in trade terms, you know, you, your size, the size of your argument in trade terms is the size of your market. But this is thinkable but it will have a price uh, to be negotiated and uh, trade negotiators uh, know how to discuss prices. Uh, it sometimes uh, never ends. Now look, I just want to ask you about something completely different, which is Scotland. If Scotland said we'd like to leave the United Kingdom and come into the EU, do you think the EU would be very keen and enthusiastic? Because frankly, in the last time the Scottish thought about leaving the UK, the EU was unhelpful to the independence case made in Scotland. The EU was like, well, it'll be difficult for you to join. If the UK leaves, would Scotland find a very easy passage in, do you think? Well, I, I listened carefully to what uh, Nicola Sturgeon said, uh, and she's a good friend of mine. Uh, I don't have to take sides, of course, although I don't have any formal official position. But I think what she said is right. The situation is fairly different from what it was uh, uh, two years ago uh, when the Scottish referendum took place. At the time, UK was a member of the European Union and the question was whether Scotland, if it exits the United Kingdom, would have to uh, reapply uh, to join the European Union. What she's saying now, it's a different thing. They are leaving, but we don't want to leave. So the picture is very different and by the way, when you see the margins with which this uh, referendum was at the end of the day uh, voted, uh, part of the people who voted no to Scottish independent voted no for reasons which may have changed if uh, the United, uh, if Great Britain uh, leaves uh, the European Union and then you are back to square one, you are back to the Treaty of Rome, uh, which says uh, the EU uh, membership is open to uh, any European country wanting to join the European Union. If Scotland becomes an independent country following a referendum, then it will apply. But the big change is that whereas two years ago, if that had happened, UK as a member of the European Union could have vetoed Scottish 
accession, <laughs> UK outside the European Union will not be able anymore to veto Scottish accession, in which case it's much more likely it will happen.